So yes, I am Cleveland Brown, CEO and co-founder of PayScout. Um, in fact, my name is Cleveland Brown Jr., which I know is a Family Guy character, so got that joke already. I know it's a football team, they, don't, they haven't won any games. Got that joke already, no reflection on my professional record. But uh, all jokes aside, um, just the fact that you guys are still here um, and the few handful, um, you're at the right place at the right time in history. And why I say that is we're, talking, we're gonna be talking about VR commerce and we're, talking, we're gonna be talking about a shift uh, in payments that uh, is gonna profoundly change uh, how we interact uh, with goods and services and pay for goods and services. So, okay. so when we talk about, when I, when I look at VR commerce, um, which is part of our topic, uh, and look at the future um, of payments, I always like to go back in history, because th this is where we learn our lessons. And I really compare this time to the dawn of e-commerce. And here's 1994, uh, welcome to Amazon.com books, one million titles, consistently low prices, um, and this was, this was your introduction to e-commerce. And at that time, uh, you can look at some other uh, companies that were around at that time as well. Blockbuster, Sears, Toys R Us. Now, one of the, one of the things that they didn't do, uh, these companies, is they didn't really ride that wave. So when you looked at um, Blockbuster and you looked at Sears and looking at e-commerce, it was something that they ignored. And now we're looking at um, VR commerce and I'll tell you a little bit about PayScout. What's our role? So PayScout's a global payment processing provider. Um, we manage payments for over 3,000 merchants globally. Uh, we do that through five layers of innovation. Um, as you see here, the one I'm most proud of here is, is our innovation of culture here, being ranked number one amongst financial services uh, companies. And we know that they're not doing too well, the Wells Fargo's of the company when it comes to financial services and company culture, but we're on the opposite, opposite end of that spectrum. And as you look at, the, look at these five layers of innovation, global alternative payments, VR, new acceptance, security, uh, regulation. These are, the, these, these are how we handle payments for um, our customers. We look at it a little bit differently. A lot of uh, companies look at payments as a commodity. Just, hey, how do I get it up? Throw you an API, throw you a terminal, um, and uh, you accept the payment. We look at payments as an opportunity, an opportunity to really explore the customer journey understand how that customer journey leads to a better, better consumer experience and ultimately leads to conversions, which is profitability. And that's why we've been one of the fastest growing companies for the last four years uh, in the United States. So the third layer that you saw there, which was VR uh, new acceptance. So when we look at VR and new payment acceptance and we talk about uh, the future, so this is, um, Bloomberg here doing uh, a, a, an interview with us because we're the first company in the world back in January of 2000, uh, in June of 2017, to execute a, a live payment for a physical good within VR without friction and delivered to the home. Uh, that's what we delivered, and that was the first implementation of, uh, of VR commerce. And that's led us to working with some great partners. Uh, one being Oracle, so you head down to SF, you'll see some of these banners here, um, and they're, they're, they're talking about the future of commerce. I invite you to visit their, their website as well and um, how they see what their vision of the future uh, is. Here's, a, here's one of the activations that we did here with Visa. Uh, there's a CEO, Al Kelly, there uh, going through one of our uh, interactive commerce experiences and engaging with our content um, at NRF. And I like to highlight this one uh, because now we're going to start, you know, I, I love talking, you know, activations, dollars and cents. What does this mean? What does this commerce mean? So this is an activation that we did with Visa uh, and the United States Olympic Committee. And what we did is we built uh, an end-to-end -end experience. Uh, it was an experience where we, could, we, we took you along uh, a journey uh, that was highlighting the Tokyo Games 2020. It was highlighting skateboarding. And the journey we took you on was an Olympic hopeful. And uh, actually putting you on a skateboard, going through a, a, a swimming pool, seeing what it's like, what does it feel like, uh, what do these athletes go through, and also took you on some trials and tribulations that she was going through, um, trying to be an Olympic hopeful. And we matched that experience with the first 
uh, online donation with, done within virtual reality. So we were able to uh, show you this experience, allow you to, after this experience, to donate to the United States Olympic Committee. And it was interesting, dollars and cents, we just set a target, just an, a nominal target. We want to hit $5,000 in donations um, in these two days. And we were able to hit that uh, very easily. So I've been on this journey for two years. Whoa. And, it's, and it started, so let's, let's look at the journey, and then, I'll, then we'll talk about it. I didn't click. <laughs> and this is what it looks like. No, <laughs> need to, do you want me to press play on this? Nope, gotta go back. That's fine, video's not working. So let me tell you, let me tell you a little bit about um, what you would see there. So, and these are activations. So in June, um, as we said, we did the first live transaction in retail. Uh, from there, we, we did the first live transaction for frictionless donations. From there, moved to live transactions done for ticket sales, for events. So really experiencing an event before you pay for those tickets and then being able to purchase those tickets while in virtual reality. Um, and you would see some of those activations and that was, um, uh, what I wanted you to see is that, is, was that particular journey. And the point of that is, is that VR commerce is here. It's here, it's being used, you see the activations, you see them with Oracle, you see them with Visa, you're seeing them, seeing them across the board with retailers, and you're seeing the, the need for this uh, globally. So the question is, do you need a VR commerce strategy? This, this okay, I, I see it's here, but do I need, what, how is this important? How is this engaging uh, um, to me? So my job really isn't to actually help you answer that question. It's really help you help others answer that question. Because those of you that are here, you're going, whether it's in your business or your customer or your base, they're coming to you. They're gonna come see you and they're gonna say, hey, how does VR commerce apply to me? The same way they talked about M-commerce and e-commerce. How does this apply to me? How does it apply to my business? You're gonna be able to deliver a solution to them and a strategy ultimately to them to, to make yourself more profitable and make your customers more profitable. And that's really the point here is that for you to be the, the stewards of uh, this new shift and this new shift in commerce. So we've synth synth synthesized this to three questions. Number one, are you using storytelling to sell your products or services? Two, do you use digital assets, images, and videos to promote your business? And number three, is your company the type that continues to reinvent and enhance products on your current platform? And I'm gonna start with the first question, are you using storytelling to sell your products or services? Now, when I'm not running one of the fastest growing companies uh, in the world, and when I'm not coaching Little League, um, I have a hobby. So storytelling is, it really resonates with me is, you know, I make movies. I'm a managing uh, a member of a, film, of a film studio, and uh, storytelling is at the heart of what we do. We try to emotionally engage uh, um, with our fans uh, as we tell stories. So storytelling, storytelling is critical, we believe, to the success of, of engagement um, with customers. In fact, if you look at this article here, storytelling, the new strategic imperative of business. Emotional engagement is the sister to rational engagement, right? They're relatives. Rational engagement is based on the stimulation of the mind, whereas emotional engagement is based upon the stimulation of the heart. So in today's age of brand experience, it seems that emotional engagement is proving to be more and more critical to achieving winning results and effective storytelling is at the heart of this movement. It's that storytelling um, that's critical. And you know, we, we always talk about you know, buying on emotion and uh, we justify with logic. And here's a picture here. And as a filmmaker, when we tell stories and we emotionally engage, if it's so important to business, we have this limitation, right? And you, we all know it, it's the, it's the frame. It's the frame you're looking at now. You know, this picture's trying to tell you uh, a story. And being limited uh, to that frame, it, it's, it, there's a level of emotional engagement. Um, there's a level of empathy uh, that we can manage uh, uh, to create. But in VR, we all know we can, step, we can put you into that story, right? So we build uh, a story with you and empathy in a way no other medium uh, can accomplish. And what's important about 
that emotional engagement that we all know is that you get to do it from your own point of view. That's the agency that happens. So that, the, the cross of agency and empathy as we look to tell stories and, and tell stories of brands, um, uh, it's, it's very critical. So why was that? So the image you just saw, that was an image of Charity Water. So this is an image of them trying to portray what, what they do in terms of providing clean and safe water to impoverished uh, communities across the globe. Noble cause. And nonprofits have a very difficult task of trying to build emotional engagement with their donor base because they can only show those images. In many cases, they can't take them to uh, that remote village. Uh, that, that was in Africa, um, so they can actually see it. But what they decided to do, and this was at the New York Metropolitan Museum where they had their um, uh, donor gala, is they decided to put everyone in the, in the locations uh, that they impacted. And when we get into dollars and cents of this, one of the donors had pledged $60,000, went through this emotional experience, this engagement, uh, in virtual reality and changed from 60,000 to 400,000. That was the power of empathy uh, in this particular uh, use case. And to further expand on empathy, um, if you're not familiar with Gartner, you know, Gartner is one of the leading advisory uh, services firms uh, uh, in the world. And uh, Brent Adamson, uh, it's, a, it's a fairly new book um, that they came out with called The Challenger Customer, Selling to the Hidden Influencer Who Can Multiply Your Results. And you're going to see, I just put up here, if you take a picture of that, great. There's some great uh, um, articles to look at empathy and how you uh, in, uh, tie empathy into uh, consumer engagement. But he makes a, a very, very uh, profound uh, point here. So when they built, when they were writing this book, what they were attempting to do was look at empathy, measure the impact empathy had on results, on conversions, on customer conversion. And time and time again, the conclusion is that empathy wasn't just being measured, it was actually the heart of this book and the heart of their research was uh, how profound the, pro profound the impact empathy has on customer conversion. So if you are storytelling, uh, and storytelling is part of your business, uh, you cannot um, ignore the power of virtual reality. There's no other medium, as I said earlier, uh, that will allow you that type of engagement. So I'll jump into the next question here. Do you use digital assets, Im images, videos, to promote your business? So the reason why I ask this question, this is question number two, is that when you think about VR, and you think about all the different use cases, and VR commerce, and what does that mean, uh, you think cost prohib it's cost prohibitive. Right. How, how am I going to afford this? How can I justify uh, this type of investment? So what you see here is I'm here to tell you that it's, it's not cost prohibitive. Um, it's actually uh, very similar to uh, an e-commerce uh, activation. And what you see here in this picture, this was the first online retailer, Body Language Sportswear. And um, what we did is we were able to take their existing digital assets. So if you already have those assets, images and videos, we were able to take those assets, obviously, and integrate those assets into a 360 degree, degree virtual world uh, that we created and repurposed those assets. So if you find someone, a partner, that knows how to repurpose assets within virtual reality, you're already 80% of the way there. So you're closer than you actually think to ex executing an activation. So, real simple, you know, how much does it cost? Brick and mortar, $100,000, $118,000 um, to find a place, um, uh, get your inventory, uh, advertise, et cetera. E-commerce, $15,000 to $30,000 to launch um, an application. And VR commerce, you'll see, is the same. So all the point here is that uh, the, it's, it's not cost prohibitive. Um, it's really about ambition at the end of the day. So if you're looking at an activation uh, for your customers, it's all about the ambition. What's your ambition? How big do you want it to be? Obviously, you can have a brick and mortar uh, rollout that's millions of dollars. An e-commerce site, that's millions of dollars. A VR commerce activation, millions of dollars. Point, the point is at the entry point, you can actually get there. And this race has started. 
So let me move into the third question here. Is your company the type that continues to reinvent and enhance products on your current platform? So you saw the first slide when I said I'm taking you back to 1994, and that was Amazon. And you think about this journey uh, where now I'm just showing you one-click checkout. And this was their previously patented technology. Is that they had joined the race so early on that they were able to in, they were able to improve the customer experience like no other company when it, when it comes to e-commerce. And this was their evolution, ultimately um, being able to do this. And that's why it's important to understand there's a race going on. I need to get into this race so I can really understand how this, this technology uh, is going to evolve. And we know what that race looks like. We know the, the ones that were in it, Amazon. Take a look here at Sears, the ones that weren't. And it's amazing when you see an infrastructure like Sears that had an opportunity to really dominate in e-commerce based on products, relationships, price points, uh, uh, logistics, and um, you see what happened. And now I know they've teamed up with Amazon, and I root for underdogs. I have to. I'm Cleveland Brown. Got to root for underdogs. So um, I I'm hoping Sears uh, comes out of it here. But when I talk about the dawn of e-commerce, why I keep bringing this up, internet users in 1995, so I showed you the, the slide there. There's Amazon, 1994. We had 16 million people. 2018, 4.157 billion people. That was the impact. So if you're continually to look to evolve yourself and, or evolve your customers, evolve your products or services, the key to that is to understand where are your customers going to be in the future and figuring out the ones that win, figure out where their customers are in the future. So let's, we're gonna run through some statistics here. VR and AR headsets to hit 80 million by 2021. The VR, AR revolution in its infancy, still with huge growth. That's the word according to industry analyst IDCs, predicting the headset market hit 13.7 million uh, units shipped. It actually was more than that in 2017, growing to a staggering 81.2 million units by 2021. Compound annual growth rate of 56.1%. Can't ignore numbers. Worldwide, one third of online consumers are expected to use VR by 2020. One third. So right now we have what? A little over half the population that's online uh, in the world. I think we have about seven point something billion people. Next, we look at VR adoption. Now this is critical because let's look at, okay, how do the trends, what do the trends look like when we look at these types of technologies? Color TV, VCR, PC, internet, cell phone. And let's put VR's chart next to these. And what you see there is the future. You see virtual reality adoption following the same trends as these other technologies. Let's dive in a little bit more. Why does it look like that? The virtual market's slow start, okay? Why does it look like that? Well, what you see here is you see uh, the difference between hardware sales and consumer and software sales. And it's, it's the, always the hardware adoption. It's bringing that hardware uh, um, at A, an affordable uh, cost to consumers. So what do we see? Cost of devices. They're, they're not only improving, the costs are going down. Okay? Content diversity. We're seeing more and more content being, being enabled in this platform. And when you think about, you know, for myself, I just think about, okay, uh, when I used, uh, uh, when I really start using the internet, I just go back to like college days and, you know, it was just really easy for me to do research. Uh, so when we talk about content diversity, it was really, you know, driving at content uh, from a research standpoint. And what we're seeing now from an education standpoint is that this is also going to fundamentally change education. It's going to fundamentally change how you research projects. You know, when uh, a professor or a teacher, even in grade school, is going to ask you to do a research paper on what's happening in sub-Sahara Africa, they're not going to just tell you to, to write about it. They're going, to, they're going to say, here's a VR experience. We're going to put you there, and I want you to tell me about the agency and the empathy. I want you to tell me how that, that impacted you, um, and, and do, do your research and do your reports. The point of it is that uh, this di content diversity is happening, and location-based VR is, is just exploding. 
You know, in China alone, 3,000 locations popping up all over the U.S. Um, as well as the world. So what you see here is an inflection point. 2019, what is this inflection point? You see that revenue were more than double year over year. So those are, those are the three main questions that uh, you need to answer if you're thinking about a VR commerce strategy. I'm not here to tell you this is for everyone. It all depends on where you, where, where you, are, where you, you are in your evolution. Um, but here's what I can tell you. If you've answered no to all of these, obviously, it's not a strategy to employ. If you've answered yes to all of these, here's my advice. One, you need a VR commerce strategy. That's number one. Number two, you need to execute it because it's already being done by, uh, by your competition. If you've only answered yes to one or two of these, then my advice is start looking at, the, at a VR commerce strategy. Start diving into it. What is this technology? And you know how you do that? is you actually use history. So go back and look at whatever product or service you're selling, whatever sector that you're in, whatever it is that you're doing, and look at how e-commerce impacted that sector. There's your homework there, and you're gonna, you're gonna have a good idea of, of the future um, of, of your business. But if you haven't answered yes to all of these, you don't need to execute, obviously. It's not time to execute. And I'll just leave you with this quote. In the same way e-commerce has fundamentally disrupted retail, virtual reality commerce is going to disrupt e-commerce. And that is the end of my presentation. So thank you. What? You want me to? All right. There you go. You caught, a, you caught a tail end of that, of, of that video. So I'm glad you got to see it. Um, if you have any more questions, if you have any questions for me, more than welcome to ask. Uh, we're a little ahead of schedule, so maybe one from the audience, if, uh, if there is one. Yes, here we go. Can you talk a little bit about the security inherent in the, in the VR commerce transactions? Uh, security. So. Good question on security. So when you, when you look at security in <clears throat> VR, uh, I'm, it's exciting because it's actually a more secure transaction than e-commerce. So why is that? Well, in, in many cases, you're using uh, your mobile device and you're using a headset that both have fingerprints, but your mobile device um, also has a layer of security, um, of, of interactivity before you can even engage uh, in a VR application. And then there's different layers of security that follow. So you have your device layer, the device layer moves into that, an, an application layer of security, the, the, that moves to a tokenization layer that happens within our payment technology. Uh, and then uh, ultimately you have the security of the card schemes, which are, which are Visa and MasterCard. So actually more secure transaction.